all right baby is here it's a boy his name is august even though he insisted on coming nine days past his due date on september 6th I, we knew for years we wanted a son named august and it was just a happy accident that we had an august due date so he gets the name even though he came in september I just wanted to do a really quick video of our birth story. We did film the whole birth and Matt will edit that and get it up. However, it, that's going to take a while. Um, I think both of us need a breather from that before we watch that footage because it was rough, y'all. It was a rough birth. I think I had it in my head that because I'd had a baby before and because I knew second time moms usually go a lot faster that that meant it would be easier. It was a lot faster. I would not use the word easier, not for a second. So after our last video, we had decided that we were going to go in Friday morning and have my water broken to induce labor. And actually that evening, my water broke on its own. So I'd had a membrane sweep Thursday night or Thursday afternoon. Um, and then around 4.30 on Thursday, I started leaking fluid. However, it did not fully break. It was what we call a high leak. So there was still a cushion or kind of a water balloon between baby's head and my cervix. So I really didn't start contracting much. And that evening I decided since I was tired rather than call the midwife and have her come break my water, I would just try and sleep and then we'd deal with it in the morning. And I actually did sleep a good chunk of that night. Um, I do feel like my water broke a little bit more around 10 p.m. because I started leaking more fluid and then had more painful contractions, but they were really irregular, like every 20 to 30 minutes. And I think I even got like a two hour chunk of sleep with probably no contractions. So anyways, the next morning I got up around 8.30, started walking around to see if I could get labor going. And I was having contractions, but they were super irregular, nothing closer than 10 minutes apart. The contractions themselves were only lasting about 30 seconds each. So I called my midwife. I was like, I think I've got a four bag, meaning that my water was not broken all the way. And she said, yeah, you're probably right. Um, I'm finishing up with another mom at the birth center. If you can come in, I'll break your water the rest of the way. And sure enough, there was a four bag. Um, and I think I was like, five to six centimeters at that point and like 90% thinned out. And so she broke my water. We got in the car to drive home. I had a couple of contractions in the car, nothing crazy. But then as soon as I got home and laid in bed, my first contraction was so intense. I called the midwife immediately and said, I have so much pressure. You need to get here now. Um, and fortunately she did. She had her, her birth assistant come. Um, but it was still about six hours then between from when she broke my water until when baby came. Y'all, it is a night and day difference laboring with your water broken versus laboring with your membranes intact. So with my daughter, um, I was in labor for a total of like 28 hours, but we didn't break my water until I was like nine and a half centimeters. Oh my gosh, laboring with my water broken the whole time made it so much more intense, so much more painful. I was not mentally prepared for that. And I don't know if it was just that, but also he was really big. He was nine pounds, 12 ounces, which is like almost 10 pounds, three pounds bigger than my daughter was. And I think the combination of those two things just made the labor so much more uncomfortable. I didn't feel like any of my coping mechanisms were really working. Like I'd get in the shower and that would work for about 15 minutes and then I'd get out of the shower and get on my hands and knees. And that would only help for about 15 minutes. And it, it's just, we kept cycling through things and it, it felt so intense, so painful, so awful that I felt like I felt in transition with my daughter. So transition is that part of labor where you get to like eight to nine centimeters right before you start pushing and you really start to feel like, oh my gosh, I can't do it. I want to quit. I want my mom. I want to go home. Those kinds of thoughts. And I felt like that pretty much the last three hours of labor. And I was seriously considering in my head like, okay, well, if I try to go to the hospital and get an epidural, am I going to be sitting up in the car and then like delivering a baby on the side of the highway, which obviously I did not want but I was seriously considering it. And the thought about getting an epidural with my daughter never once crossed my mind. So totally different experience. Um, but we did it. We, we got to the point where um, I had my midwife check my cervix because I wanted to push and I was only seven centimeters and I was devastated. Like I thought for sure that I you know was like nine and a half, almost ready to go. And I really had to like regroup mentally, um, reassess where I was at. She had me get back in the shower. Um, and then I sat up in bed for a little bit and was actually able to like doze in between contractions for a few minutes before I got that urge to push. So probably seven centimeters to completely dilated, um, only took me about an hour. And I'll be honest, I didn't actually get to completely dilated. She checked me. I asked her to check me 
And she was like, oh, you're like nine and a half. There's just a little room of cervix. And mentally, I was so done at that point. I was like, I don't care. I'm pushing. I'm pushing past it. And so um, I got onto my hands and knees and pushed him out in about seven or eight contractions. Um, That also was way more intense this time just because he was so big. Um, But also because I didn't wait for the spontaneous urge to push because I was over it. I was like, just get this baby out of me. So anyways, his heart rate had dropped while I was pushing. And the midwife said, you got to get him out on the next contraction. and. I think it's almost fortunate that she said that because I would have definitely backed away from the sensations I was feeling because his head felt so much bigger than my daughter's. Like I remember as I was pushing my daughter out, they were like, you're crowning. And I thought like, oh, this isn't as bad as I thought it would be. Not this time. Um, I did tear and I felt it and that was not great. Um, But we got him out on the next contraction and he was crying and doing wonderful. Um, And he's just so perfect. When you tear, you don't always tear your perineum, and my perineum did not tear. It was intact. Typically, when you're pushing a baby out on hands and knees, it does put more pressure on your urethra and the uh, anatomy on the upper part of your vulva, and so those areas are more likely to tear. And unfortunately, what happened for me, and this is your warning to click away now or skip ahead if you don't want to hear this, but my left labia minora split in half horizontally and then like tore all the way back into my vaginal sidewall. And so... Um, when the midwife told me that I was kind of thinking like, Ooh, I really do not want to be awake for that repair. Um, if you've been following me, you know that I, my placenta got stuck last time and I had to go to the hospital to get my placenta out. And at that point when she told me about, about the tear, I think, um, I was about 30 minutes postpartum and the placenta still hadn't come and she'd given me a shot of Pitocin and we'd been trying to push it out and I'd sat on the birth stool and tried to push it out and everything. Um, and so then I started kind of mentally thinking like, Ooh, I kind of do want to transfer to the hospital to get my placenta out so they can put me to sleep and put me to sleep for the repair. And and unfortunately, I did have to transfer to the hospital to get the placenta out. We gave it about an hour. Um, Our plan had only been to give it about 30 minutes, but he really hadn't latched yet at that point. And I wanted to get a good nursing session in before we went to the hospital if it wasn't an emergency. Anyways, we had not transferred to the hospital yet at that point, um, even though it had been 30 minutes just because I wanted him to nurse really well before we did that. And I also thought him nursing might help get the placenta out. But unfortunately, the exact same thing happened as last time. Like I gave birth, I completely stopped contracting, even though I nursed him, even though they gave me a shot of Pitocin. And and at about an hour after um, birth, we decided to go to the hospital. And fortunately, I'd been updating one of my colleagues who's an OBGYN. She was our backup plan the whole time. Um, She'd been calling and texting intermittently with my husband throughout labor just to see how things were going. And so as soon as I called her and was like, hey, the placenta's not coming out, she said, come on into the hospital. I'll meet you there. I'll get the OR team assembled. And so even though the birth was a lot more difficult and a lot more rough this time. The hospital transfer went much more smoothly. Um, last time that was a pretty traumatic experience for me. Um, and I'd been threatened with a hysterectomy. And this time I just walked in, they got an IV started. She consented me for a DNC and also to repair my labia while she was, um, while I was under anesthesia. And it was just so wonderful to be at my own hospital with an OBGYN who is my friend and OR staff who I work with and who I know and they know me and they took such good care of me. And it was just, it was such a good experience. So, um, you know, as far as everything goes, he was born at like 4.59 in the evening. I think we got to the hospital close to almost seven maybe. Um, And by the time I got out of the OR, it was like 9.45 and then I was home by midnight. And so that was pretty great. Um, And things have been really pretty good since. He's a really good eater. Uh, I am way more sore this time. I felt like after my daughter was born, I could have hopped up and ran a marathon and (laughs) It's not how I feel this time. So um, definitely having to learn to like scale it back. That laceration, man, standing for any period of time feels terrible. I tried to go grocery shopping like day two postpartum. Absolutely not. Um, and, and it's been really hard for me to try and like stay on the couch um, and just rest. I'm also feeling pretty tired and you can tell I have no color in my lips. So I'm going in for an IV iron infusion on Thursday because I lost a lot of blood. But overall, like, even though I feel kind of rough, like, we're doing well. We're just so glad he's here. We just wanted to give you guys an update. Thank you, everyone who's been so supportive and who's offered their congratulations. It is such a wild ride going from IVF 
to the whole pregnancy and everything we've been through. And now to like actually get a baby at the end of it feels way too good to be true. So yeah, you're pretty great, huh? Yeah. So I think he's hungry again. He's like cluster feeding continuously, which he's almost 10 pounds. Can you blame him? So anyways, we will work on getting the birth video up. Oh, honey. Anyways, we will work on getting the birth video up. It'll just take a while. Um, coming up, I kind of want to go over my birth plan. I know I said that I would do that prior to baby coming, um, but I think it would be fun to actually just like go over the birth plan and what we actually stuck to and what we, what, what we didn't. And then also, if you're Jewish, you might know that most baby boys get named at their breasts. And obviously, we've already named him because we are not doing a breast. And I thought it would be interesting to do a video just about... Um, even though as a Jewish family, why we're not circumcising, if that's something you might be interested in. So um, just make sure you subscribe, turn on the notification bell so you don't miss those videos. <sighs> Thank you so much for watching.